And Hashem spoke to Moshe from the Oihel Moyed, from the tent of meeting, saying, and it continues talking about sacrifices. So the the question that the, the oh, well, the, the, the commentaries ask a number of questions on this verse. The most famous question is, why did Hashem call him and then speak to him? What is this calling for? And Rashi talks about it. The Yorachayim talk about it. We're not really going to go into that <clears throat> so much, but I, I, I did want to mention it, that on a simple level, Hashem wanted to show Moshe that he is very, uh, he cherishes him, and therefore he would call him before he actually spoke to him. He sort of like gave him a, a um, uh, an introduction, an introductory call before he actually would speak to him. And just as a sign of, uh, of, of cherishing and um, a sign of chiba, love, sign of love to Moshe. That's, that's the, uh, and that's regarding the calling Moshe and then speaking to him. In other words, there's two terms here that one of them is really redundant. They could have just said Hashem spoke to him as follows. But he called him and he spoke to him because he showed him how much he loved him by giving him that uh, uh, initial call and afterwards speaking to him. Okay, but the, uh, the Arachayim is bothered with a different question. Why does it not say Vayikra Hashem al Moshe? Hashem called Moshe. Instead it says and he called Moshe. So that's the question of the Ar Hachayim. Stop the share now. Stop the share screen. Okay. So the Ar Hachayim says just trying to figure out again, the Ar Hachayim what he often does is he really digs into the wording of the verses and he comes out with a lot of, often he'll come out with some interesting hints that the Torah is hinting to us. And here what he says is that Hashem called to Moshe, but he doesn't say Hashem's name. And he says maybe, perhaps the reason is that when Hashem called to Moshe, the understanding is that Hashem used a very loud voice and Moshe heard it. In other words, it was directed to Moshe. And even though there were others there nearby, because there were people, Kohanes, doing the service, in the tabernacle. Nevertheless, only Moshe heard it and no one else heard Hashem's voice. So even though Hashem screamed his voice out loud, nevertheless, it was in, in a miraculous way that only Moshe would hear it and the sound wave simply did not travel to anyone else that was there. And that's hinted to by the fact that it says, Vayikra el Moshe. He called directly to Moshe, implying that this, in other words, it didn't want to interrupt by saying, and Hashem called to Moshe, but it wanted to say that the sound, so it's more about the sound. So it says, Vayikra, and he called, meaning the sound went to Moshe. And he called, not about Hashem. In other words, it's not, it doesn't want to inter, in, 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 interrupt this uh, uh, point. And therefore, it just says, Vayikra el Moshe, that he called to him with this loud voice. And even so, it did not go to anyone else. It only hit, it only uh, uh, affected Moshe. Moshe was the only one who heard it. Um, if it would say, Vayikra Hashem el Moshe, it would sound like Hashem made a loud voice and it ultimately traveled and reached Moshe, maybe without being so loud. And possibly uh, others that were nearby um,
the the uh, the understanding would be that maybe the voice was not only directed to Maisha, but it was directed as loud, and Maisha ultimately heard it. And here, the Erechayim tells us that the reason it doesn't say Hashem's name, to emphasize the fact that the voice was clearly directed to Maisha. Now, if Hashem did not direct it to Moshe, but he just screamed out the voice, and Moshe ultimately heard, so Moshe would understand, oh, other people maybe didn't hear because it's not so loud to me. Maybe it's even less loud to them. And so therefore, Hashem uh, writes, Vayikra el Moshe, that the Torah has skipped out Hashem's name, emphasizing that the voice was directed to Moshe, that it was extremely loud to Moshe, and still no one else heard, which shows the greatness of Hashem, the power of Hashem, that Hashem could hear this very loud voice, loud sound, that Moshe heard this very loud sound that was directed to him, and yet no one else heard it. Um, now, another, so that's one understanding. Again, it's emphasizing the fact that the voice was loud, and even so, directed. no one else. Even so, it wasn't. What did you say? Directed. Directed. It was loud and directed to him, and even so, no one else heard it. Now, the uh, the, the next uh, approach that the Urachaim gives is that. Rabbi. Yes. It should have been easy for Hashem. Because voices are certain decibels, and certain people, certain animals listen hear can hear different dec decibels. So if Moses had a certain decibel that he can hear and others couldn't, Hashem would know how to talk to him loud. Right. How about he Hashem spoke in a regular decibel, and yet uh, only Moshe heard and no one else. That's a miracle. <laughs> That's a miracle. <laughs> That's what it's saying. Now, uh, so Hashem could have made it easier. You're right, but this was uh, this was how, how Hashem did it. Now, the other the other approach he says is that the reason why it doesn't say Hashem's name and it just says Hashem that he called Moshe because the um, the Torah is emphasizing this idea that I mentioned earlier that it's all about honoring Moshe with a like a, a calling, a, uh, a little in, in, introduction, a preparation call. In other words, that Hashem gave him this, this introduction before he actually spoke to him. So because of that, it's emphasizing that by Yikra el Moshe, that he called to Moshe, uh, in other words, this was this was just this was that that call. It's not it's not the actual speech that Hashem is speaking to him. It's just the actual call. Uh, Moshe, I'm going to be speaking to you soon, and so therefore, it's say Hashem. You know, it's going to have to say Hashem's name. But is should Hashem's name be written when he called him, or should it be written when he speaks to him? So the understanding is. That since Hashem is doing both, he's speaking to Moshe, and before he speaks to him with the commandments, he's calling him. So which one should say Hashem's, should actually say Hashem's name? So it says, so the understanding is that uh, it would be a more, better choice, more preferred, that when it came to the commandments of the mitzvah, that's when it uses Hashem's name. And here it's, it's it's calling Hashem is calling Moshe out of respect. So it's it, it, here it wouldn't actually use Hashem's name. It could just say he. In other words, one of them is going to use a pronoun, and one of them it's going to say Hashem's name. So it so the choice was to do it when it came to a mitzvah. 
this was only a uh, like a introduction or preparation, an honor. So uh, it didn't have to say Hashem's name. That's the uh, that's the second interpretation. Um, the third interpretation he says is an uh, interesting medrash. The medrash says that Aaron and his kids and the elders all wondered who is the most beloved before Hashem. In other words, Hashem had had all of us ascend Har Sinai together with Moshe. So, are we in the same league? Is you know what what is the what is the level of belovedness that Hashem has? Who who's most? So here it says Vayikra El Moshe, and he called to Moshe. So the elders and Aaron and the kids. The, it, all of them basically realized that, ha, that Moshe is the most beloved. What is that? I said he ain't calling me. He ain't calling me. <laughs> but he did. But he did speak to the elders and to Aaron and to Aaron's kids, so to speak. The, uh, the Har Sinai. They all went together. Whatever. Whatever. But so there's a thought that they might have had that uh, they're all the same level. So on this, Hashem wrote in the Torah of Ayikra al Moshe that he called to Moshe, and by saying that, uh, it's basically uh, answering their question. And uh, uh, therefore, it didn't have to say Hashem's name. It's only just to simply emphasize this point Everyone was waiting to see who Hashem uh, chose most. And by saying he called to Moshe, it, it basically answered that question. Uh, bye. The, uh, the the way they explain it here, the common one of the commentaries wants to say that it's emphasized. The point is that it's all about who he called to, not who called. No, it's not about Hashem calling. It's about who called to Moshe by saying that. Can you please stop? By saying that uh, 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 he called to Moshe, we basically see we basically answered their question that uh, who Hashem is considers most beloved i must tell you that the medrash is a little surprising uh, you know you would think that it's pretty clear because moshe it says was closest then came aaron and then came the elders which that which would seem to imply that we sort of know who's the most beloved so the, the, the it is a surprising medrash and the 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 uh, Chaim does not explain the medrash he just says that that according to that medrash this would be the answer that Hashem was so to speak answering and that would be why it didn't have to say Hashem's name here so it's a surprising medrash and I don't have an interpretation for it uh, why why you know how they would have thought I you know I would think it's more obvious. Uh, so what exactly? There must be a deeper meaning to this medrash, but based on this medrash, this would be the this would answer the question of the uh, why why the Torah doesn't say Hashem's name because that's not the emphasis here. It's all about who he called, not about they knew it was from Hashem. They didn't that that's not necessary. It's all about who he called. Uh, David, you wanted to say something or ask something? Yeah, I'm just following along. I have a balaturim. So, oh. um, okay. yeah, so um, he, uh, he doesn't say this. This is my own edition, this piece here. Why does it say above in the beginning? Because it sounds like and. It's like a continuation. Okay, right, it's a continuation. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so the Balaturim says that if you look in the previous verse from uh, Shamos, Right. Yeah, the verse says, the cloud of Hashem would be on the tabernacle by day, and the fire would be on it by night. 
uh, before the eyes of all of, of the house of Israel in all their journeys. Journeys. So he makes a comment regarding the second part where it says Vesh Tia Lila Bo, and the fire would be on it at night. And he says that the it Bo can be understood also. It's in him that the fire burned in in Moshe's face, wow. and it Powerful. burned in Moshe. That was visible on his face. So he also, as he says, uh, this is from Perush Harokeach. This is in uh -huh. the elucidation part. He says that if, and also Besik, Besik the Rabbah, says Moshe would stand and the word of Hashem would come directly into his ear as though it's through a pipeline. Consequently, no other person was able to hear it. Nevertheless, all of them would know that the word of Hashem had come to Moshe for they would see a reddish glow on his face. Uh huh. And then as, wow. as he continues, he says, with this medrash, the Baal term explains the use of the word bow, literally means in him. Mm -hmm. How'd they see his face? I mean, he wore a mask. He wouldn't see the he reddish didn't... cloak. He had no, a mask. He, he, he didn't have the mask when Hashem spoke to him. But the only but, question is... When he's first knocking, when he first starts, when Hashem starts the conversation... He took it off before. Well, well uh, I mean, he's called. Uh, he, well, are you saying when he's called right. or when he's in there? Uh, no, I guess, no, I'm I guess, saying. I guess you're right. When he's called, maybe he didn't have it. But the question is, how did they see him? He was inside the oil mighty. So they would see him there. I mean, uh, they would be able to see from the sides, maybe from the sides, the door, the entrance to the oil mighty. No, oh, the way the the way it was in a covered, it definitely covered it. Not like the hmm? it not wasn't like... like it wasn't like the kapores was between the two end posts of the walls. The walls were there and then it was bigger than the walls from the outside. I what believe you, if anybody has an illustration wait, of what the you, what Mishkan, you, you're talking about the 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 chutzir, the courtyard of the Mishkan, or you're talking about the actual Mishkan itself. I'm saying the Mishkan itself was smaller, narrower than the kapores that was in front of it. The parochas. The parochas. Sorry. So the parochas was wider. Than the front, so you could not see in from the sides of the parochas. No, you're, you're right. Into but the I don't Mishkan. Know, you're right, but I don't know that Moshe went into the Holy of Holies every time Hashem spoke to him. Not the whole. I'm talking to, about. I'm talking about just the Kadosh. The Kadosh just the, the, holy. Holy. the holies didn't have a parochas. Sure, it didn't in have front the, of the Mishkan. What the the the, the oh the, oh wait you're saying in front of the in front of the, the entrance ah, in front of the entrance itself there was no separate it was only by the front gate that it was like that there by the a, chutzer. There chutzer. chutzer the chutzer exactly. there was a kapiris a parochus well and, which, and which is not called the parochus but it was called a masa right and that was also wider than the it, entrance that it was covering well, that's a that's another story. That there was space in between. It was like you know th there was a area where you could see from the sides into the chutzer, you know, because it it didn't really close it completely. There were fifteen amis on each side, and then you had a masach that was that was pushed backwards so that people could actually get in, and that was twenty amis. So it was thirty by by twenty, right? Because it was fifty amis. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure how they're translating this uh, this this interpretation of it. Of how did they actually see Moshe? They saw the fire burning when Hashem spoke to him. Is that what they're saying? So no, they saw Hashem speaking to him. Yes, yeah, as the fire burned in Moshe's face, it was visible on his face, and they wow. would see a red, and they would see a reddish glow. What I'm uh -huh. thinking it could be that he was wearing the mask. And if his whole face is burning, he has the mask on. And on the sides, there might be some reddish glow coming Wait, out so from I, the I, sides. Are you saying after he left from hearing Hashem, his face, it still burned? 
what, how are they translating it? It, it? it burned while Hashem spoke them or after he left? Yeah. Um, no, while. It's a, so it's I don't a, know that everyone saw him then. It's, I mean, it's, it's, I guess they could have seen maybe inside. They could have seen him in the... So you want to say they saw him while he was... Yeah, well, I guess the the the, the Kayanim were there. The Kayanim were there doing the service in the in the tabernacle. Yeah. So I guess it's possible, right? They saw him and uh they saw the fire in him. Okay, I guess that that's what it means. So while he was there, so he didn't have a mask on because Hashem was speaking to him. He didn't have a mask on. Uh -huh. Hashem's... So that's the problem. Did, so when he did have the mask on, if he's when he if he has... they didn't see the fire. They wouldn't see they wouldn't see it. They put the mask because it covered it. No, but yeah. I think you they, might see the glow. No. That's what I'm saying. He's, they saw the glow. It's coming but, out from the sides. But, but what does it from say his that? Eyes from the front. What? One second. Does it say that? It doesn't say that. It, it says all of them would know the word that the word of Hashem would come to Moshe, for they would see a reddish glow on his face. There you go. I, I I think it's referring to when Hashem was speaking to him, not after. This, it says this right. is in Besik uh, Besik the uh -huh. From it's from Maybe. Medrash. Okay. Uh, uh, again, that's that's my thought. I didn't look it up, so we'll have to uh, we'll have to see if anyone wants to do their research and look it up. Um, uh, in any event, uh, getting back to so we had the third interpretation of why it doesn't say Hashem's name, and um, and now the next insight of the Arachayim is the next insight is uh, that. It, it says Hashem spoke to him from the Oyel Mayi. Now it could have said Hashem spoke from the Oyel Mayi to him. In other words, where are you first and who are you speaking to afterwards? So it first says who Hashem spoke to. And the Archaim says that's a little surprising. Normally you would say, Hashem spoke from this place, and then it would say to who? It says it's hinting to us that Moshe Rabbeinu spoke everything that Hashem said to him, commanded, he gave over to the Jewish people. And that's why it says that Hashem spoke to him from the oil mayed, and and it says right afterwards the word saying. In other words, to say over that Hashem spoke to him from the oil mayed to say over. That means everything that Hashem said to him, he should tell over to the Jewish people. And the point is that. That Hashem, that in other words, that he said it over in just one second. Kids, um, Rachel, could you play outside with the um, on the on the uh, on the bicycles and on the, the cars? You want to play outside with them? Please do that first. So, um, so it, it says that that Moshe Rabbeinu. While he was at the Oyel Maye, that's where he spoke all the words that Hashem told him to the Jewish people while he was there. In other words, he was standing right there. I don't know exactly, uh, inside, at the edge, whatever it was. He was there from the Oyel Maye. He spoke to the Jewish people. And the, the idea is that people should realize and testify that Moshe Rabbeinu did not add anything in the not subtracting. So in other words, Hashem was hinting to him, in other words, the verse, or the verse is hinting to us, that Moshe Rabbeinu was meant, and what he did was to speak from the Ayol Mayed, and from there he told it to the Jewish people. Now, the, the, I, the, the point is that if he was there and... He was in front of Hashem, so to speak. In other words, the awe, the awesomeness of Hashem being, so to speak, right? Of course, Hashem is everywhere. 
but being right there in such a holy place. So it, it gave the people the trust in Moshe that he obviously is not lying. You know, there's a, a in such a place, you know, it'd be very surprising for him to to uh, add anything or subtract anything right in front of the divine presence. You know, even any other place would also mm -hmm. be surprised, but here it would be extremely surprising. Now, um, another hint that is mentioned. So, so again, so let me just clarify what this. Uh, let me just um, explain to you how you see this in the verse. The verse says that Hashem spoke to Moshe from the Oihel Moye to say over to the Jewish people. So Hashem spoke to Moshe from the Oihel Moye would sound like, okay, see, Hashem told Moshe in the Oihel Moye. But the fact that it says from the, the in the Oihel Moye next to saying over to the Jewish people implies that from the Oihel Moye, that's where he spoke all of this to the Jewish people. That while he was there, and that's why it says it in this order and not in a different order where the Oihel Moye, meaning the tent of meeting, would have been placed in a different place in the verse, it wouldn't have implied that Moshe was there when he said it to the Jewish people, which is, of course, not the simple understanding. When you think about where did Moshe speak to the Jewish people, you think he, he left the tent of meeting and he went to where they were in the camp. That's the simple understanding. But the Archaim is saying this is a hint that Moshe gave over the teachings that he was taught, that he was told while he was standing there or nearby the Oyel Mayed in front of Hashem, so to speak, and emphasizing the uh, that the the uh, that they should have full trust in him, and uh, um, and uh, and and the fact that he would be afraid to change anything around, and they would have full trust in him that he did not change anything around. And additionally, he says another line here that I actually skipped out, that when the people would hear Hashem's command, the, the awe of Hashem's word, the Amos Hadibur, the awe of Hashem's word, would be there on the listeners. Because in other words, it's at the place, the location where Hashem said it. So it would also have that element of the, the, the fear of Hashem, the Amos Hadibur, the fear of the speech of Hashem, the divine word would be upon the listeners because it's like right at that location where Hashem said it. So that is a interesting insight that I didn't, I don't think would have been the simple understanding. I don't think that's the, uh, the, the, when you learn the Chumash, you don't normally assume that he spoke to the Jewish people from the Yoyal but that's an interesting hint to it. Now, uh, the Archaim continues and he says, that this uh, the the words from the tent of meeting is next to where Moshe is supposed to say it over to the Jewish people. So it says Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting to say over to the Jewish people. So what the Archaim is basically saying in both of these interpretations, the first one, which we said already, the second one, which I'm about to say, is basically connecting the tent of meeting with the Jewish people that he's going to say it over to, because it says it right next to it. In, in, the, he, in the Hebrew term, it would be called doyresh smuchin. He's expounding on things that are juxtaposed and put right next to each other. So what, what, what we're saying here, what we're seeing here is that the tent of meeting is put right next to the saying it over to the Jewish people. So the first thing we said was, yeah, he actually said it over at the tent of meeting. The next thing he says is that Hashem is telling the, Hashem is basically saying that because the tent of meeting is a sign that Hashem forgave the Jewish people, which we've talked about before, that the fact that there's a tent of meeting, a tent and an oil moye, that's a tent of the tent of meeting is a sign to the Jewish people. You know what? You're forgiven for the golden calf. 
That's the idea of the tent of meeting. Now, when when it when it says here in the verse that Hashem spoke to Moshe from the tent of meeting to tell over to the Jewish people, what it's saying is, you know why Hashem is speaking to you? It's because of the tent of meeting to tell over to the Jewish people. He's only speaking to you because Hashem forgave. Because Hashem forgave the Jewish people, therefore Hashem is speaking to you from, in other words, he's, you're meriting, you're able, you're meriting that Hashem will speak to you. So it's a love, may oyel mayed, that it's Hashem is speaking to you because of the oyel mayed, because the tent of meeting and uh, Hashem forgave the Jewish people. So therefore, Hashem speaks to you, but not because of you yourself. Your whole merit is only um, is only because of the Jewish people, and you should speak this over, tell this to the Jewish people. That's why it says Lamar to say this con this this message. You should tell the Jewish people, and I think the message, the idea behind that is to give Moshe a sense of humility doesn't say this clearly but why would he want Moshe to why would he want to tell this to Moshe and why would he want Moshe to tell this to the Jewish people so tell it to the Jewish people is giving them a clear confirmation that they're they've merited atonement um and to to maybe emphasize it again of course they uh know that they were atoned seemingly from Yom Kippur, but yet uh, Hashem wants him to repeat this to the Jewish people. And that's why it says it here, Lamar. In other words, the way the Archaim is learning is that this idea it should be said over to the Jewish people, not just laws. Of course, the laws are what is the simple meaning, but it's a hint that you should tell the Jewish people this point that, that you know, Moses, your whole merit, is only the fact that the Jewish people are forgiven, and therefore, because of them, uh, that's why I'm speaking to you. And uh, uh, if you look in the verse, that's that's how the verse flows. Hashem spoke to him because of the oil mayid. May oil mayid is like because of the oil mayid, because there's a tent of meeting that I, that's a sign that Hashem forgave the Jewish people. That's why I'm speaking to you and tell this over now to the Jewish people that their whole that my, the whole merit you have is only because of them. Which actually is also a little seemingly a contradiction to the earlier uh, uh, medrash that we mentioned that who does Hashem cherish more? So now it sounds like Hashem's cherishing is the Jewish people, not really Moses, even though before we emphasized, we said, Oh, you see, from the fact that Hashem is calling Moshe means Hashem's cherishing Moshe more than the Jewish people. And here seems to be saying that the the uh, the only reason Hashem is even speaking to Moshe is because Hashem forgave the Jewish people, and it's in their merit that Hashem is speaking to Moshe and dwelling in this tent of meeting. So that's a little contradictory. So how do you how do you reconcile that? So the simple and simple way of answering such a contradiction is that there's different midrashic interpretations, and according to one midrashic interpretation, this is more understandable. According to the other midrashic interpretation. The, another way is more understandable. Now, uh, it says over here, he brings from a medrash, and he says, tell them over words that will conquer them. Words, words that will capture their hearts. And he says, this is the meaning. Now we know what he's supposed to say. He says, say over this idea. That it's because of you 
that Hashem is speaking to me. It's all in your merit. And uh, so that's the that's the understanding. So so that on a simple level, that's how you you uh, you answer such a question that there's two different midrashic uh, interpretations. But I think if you go a little deeper, maybe you could you could come up with an answer, and that is that Moshe is very cherished by Hashem, but it is it, the, the Jewish people's account helps for Moshe to be cherished by Hashem. In other words. Who does Hashem cherish most? Yes, it's Moshe. But Moshe, not just for his own, because of his own merits, but it's also because he has the Jewish people following him. In other words, he gets all the merits of the Jewish people as well. He's got the Jewish people following him, and therefore their merit ends up helping Moshe Rabbeinu. And if they didn't have merit, Hashem would actually lose his, so to speak, respect or full respect for Moshe Rabbeinu. And uh, Moshe wouldn't have all this merit. So in other words, there is a great cherishing that Hashem has for Moshe, but it really has to do with the Jewish people. If everything is going smooth, then Hashem gives, you know, cherishes Moshe. It's almost like if you have a manager who's doing a good job and the people like the manager, then, you know, you sort of like, you appreciate, you know, you're, you're happy to give the manager a raise. But if, you know, he, the manager is not uh, accomplishing, is not, ful not uh, fulfilling his role, so to speak, perfectly with the people, so then you sort of, uh, it lose, he loses your respect as well, even if you like him and you chose him, you chose him to be manager, but it's sort of, uh, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly. So in other words, here, it, it it's it's on account of the Jewish people, but it ultimately brings Moses, brings Moshe special cherishing. But it also shows how much Hashem cherishes the Jewish people because he cares about them. And his whole, the whole purpose is only for the, is, o, is only ultimately uh, for the, the uh, for the, the Jewish people is, is the goal here that they should, that Hashem wants them and he forgave them. So it's about the Jewish people and ultimately there will be a benefit to Misha. But it will, these words will capture their hearts that it's all on account of them. Now, uh, someone had a question. Uh, ben, did you, uh, did you want to say something? I had, I had, I think that there's different aspects to each story. And without their nation, Moses doesn't have a job. It's the huh. same like we say Hashem is our king but he has to be a king with a nation. Right, right. So to a certain extent, that's true, except that the fact that Moshe seems to be have the special relationship with Hashem, which you would think, because Hashem he, did offer Moshe, he says, you know what, I'm going to kill everyone else, but you will be the Jewish people. So there seems to be this, this, I, this element of Moshe being uh, very cherished by Hashem, even without the Jewish people. And uh, uh, the ultimately... Same with Hashem, he's... he's He's, he can still be a king without a nation, too. Well, yeah, just the he term can be the king, king would of work. the world. He can be the king of the animals. He can be the king of anything, you know. Well, the, the commentaries say that the word king only works if you have subjects that are that are you know within that are on a certain on a certain level of subjects. You know what I mean? Like uh, angels wouldn't make Hashem king. Hashem would just be master and. You know, so certain things would just make you know. Would, would, to be king, you need to have people. To be uh, the the, the, the to rule over animals. What was that? To be a, a leader like Moses, you have to have people too. You have to have people. You have to have willing acceptance by them. It has to be a conscious acceptance of Melusa over themselves. The same with a leader. Yeah. Correct, correct. That's an uh, interesting point. So it, it comes out that, that Moshe is cherished and the Jewish people are very cherished. Now, uh, um, the next thing that the uh, Archaim says, another exposition of the word Lamar is uh, along, this, along these lines that 
all of the speech that Hashem spoke to Moshe is all for the Jewish people to convey to them and not to uh, nothing like private between themselves. It was basically um, that from the oil, whatever he got, he gave over. It was meant to be given over. And according to this, what it means is that the only thing Hashem really spoke to Misha was words of Torah that were meant to be given over to the Jewish people. And he says that's the idea that Moshe kibol Torah misinai umasara leyoyishua. There's a famous word words that we have in a Mishnah that it says the the Mishnah and the ethics of our fathers. It says Moshe received the Torah from Sinai and gave it over to Joshua, and Joshua to the elders and so on. And so the uh, the uh, the point that the Urchaim is making from that Mishnah is that uh, whatever he got, he gave over. Whatever he got from Sinai, he received it at Sinai and he gave it over. Like he didn't keep anything to himself. It was all meant to be given over. And Hashem didn't tell him any secrets that the Jewish people didn't know. That was whatever secrets Hashem told him, they were meant to be given over to the Jewish people, and he did. And so in knowledge, Moshe was equal to the Jewish people. It's a very interesting thing. When I was preparing this, I was like thinking about this. Uh, how could this be? Um, but this is a uh, insight based on this verse. Um, and so he basically shared all of his knowledge with the Jewish people. And uh, he learned it from Hashem. And the only difference was that he heard it straight from Hashem. They heard it from a person, Maisha. But uh, ultimately, Rabbi, he shared everything with them. Yes. My cousin David was, was, I don't know if he still is, a brilliant lawyer who worked for somebody in New York called Al Julian. He was a very famous negligence lawyer, sued uh, Ron Jalela, the photographer. So he once heard him give a speech to the students. And then when he finished the speech, he went over to him and said, Al, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention that. And Al Julian said a very good line. David, just because I taught them everything they know doesn't mean I taught them everything I know. So I would say here, Moshe taught us everything that we know of Tyra and of Hashem or whatever. But to say that Moshe taught us everything he knew, I have a problem with that. I, 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 I don't disagree with you. It, it sounds surprising, but if you look in the words of the Arachayim, this is what he seems to be saying. And, uh, uh, he, I mean, he, you know, he seems to say it pretty clear. Hushvu Yisrael Moshe Biyadiyah. I mean, Biyadiyah. Hushvu Yisrael Moshe Biyadiyah. And Shalai Lama Shalai Hoidiyah Hashem Soid Shalai Limda Yes Yisrael. He didn't, Hashem didn't teach him any secrets that he didn't, anything, right. he didn't. Now, right. I, the way I, the way I understood it was I, add, I, I, I think there's one little point that could be added here because it does seem surprising, but I think the point, if you add this point, maybe it is a little un, more understandable. And that is that Moshe had a deep, had a way of understanding, he was, could grasp things in a deep way, Kabbalistic, mystical stuff, and so on. If they grasped it or not, you know, to what extent they were able to grasp it, was based on them, based on their level of holiness. But Moshe grasped the, the you know, whatever Hashem taught him. Did he share it with them? Yes, he shared with them the, the, the secrets, the... Uh, the deep, the deep ideas, the mystical ideas, he shared with them. Did they grasp everything? Whatever they were on the level to grasp, maybe. Right. So again, it doesn't, now, does it fit perfectly here? Hushvu Yisrael Moshe B'Yidiyah. I think it fits. The Yidin were equal to Moshe in knowledge. In other words, they they heard whatever Moshe, whatever Moshe had, but, but, uh, they, they, well, they, knowing they, it, Knowing but, but it and they, comprehending they, they it. Did they comprehend this? Another story. Right. So did they so I think that's what the the, the, the means here. And if you think if you understand it that way, 
I think it is, under, I think, it, and I think it's a very innovative point. In other words, this is something, this is called a chidush. This is surprising. And this is hinted to in this pasuk. Did you think that Moshe really shared all of those secrets with the whole B'nai Yisrael? I'm sure he heard great secrets and mystical things. Did you always learn it that way? No, I don't know if the, the typical way of learning, but this is the this is the insight uh, from the Arachim that he actually shared everything with the Jewish people. Did they? Did they? Maybe maybe they didn't. Uh, 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 again, and he doesn't say it clearly that they didn't. They, a lot of them maybe didn't grasp everything. They grasped the point to their understanding, but I think that's the meaning of it. Yes, Susan. Susan? I think we're still learning. I don't think we ever stop learning, and we're still open to different interpretations of the Torah. I, I can't possibly feel that the words themselves mean are the words themselves. There's a lot more that we don't know. Right, right. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next thing that um, the Arachayim talks about is the next verse. That was all on verse one. Now we come to verse two. And verse 2 says, speak to the Bnei Yisrael and say to them. And why does it say that twice? Not, not only saying it twice, but why does it say two different terms? Speak to them, Daber and Amarta. And say to them. Uh, Daber is... Um, in addition to being redundant, it's also like switching terms. Speaking, saying, why, why does it switch from one term to the other? Even if there is a reason to be redundant and to say it twice, but say the same term. Why are you switching from one to the other? So this is, of course, a, a obvious potential for uh, hinting something, that that is referring to this, and the other is referring to something else. So we're going to soon see some hints. Yes, uh, Ben. I, I think it's normal to say it that way because I, we see it many times. The bear means talk to them and tell them. They don't use the same word <laughs> twice. So if you were talking about a regular book, maybe I would agree with you that you could sometimes have such a term. But in the Torah, every letter is counted, is accounted for. And... Uh, uh, it, it is surprising. If it's not ne necessary, it shouldn't be there. No, it is necessary. When you say, talk to them and tell them such and such, it's limited. The talk can be anything. But telling them, you tell them what, what you are told to tell them. Well, let me ask you this. If I was telling someone uh, about my class today and I yeah. tell them, oh, let me, I'm going to, I, I spoke to my class and, and I, I told, told them, them this. Right. Now that's really, that's really wasting someone's time. I should just say, I taught my class the following thing, not I spoke to my class and I told them this. That, that, that's redundant. It's not necessary to say it that way. I, if I'm going to tell someone about my class, I'll tell them, you know, I taught my class this and this today. That would be the normal thing to say. Now, people have a lot of free time and some people talk and talk and talk and they, they might say it this way. But it's not a it's you know, it's not you don't need to say that. You don't need to, to say it again. I'm not right. saying no one speaks that way, but I'm just saying like it's uh, there's definitely room to darshan it, to expound on it because it's not it's it, it's not necessary. Right. Um, so again, yeah, yes, Moshe. You know, we have to take into account that Moshe Rabbeinu, he was interacting with the Svirot that was not possible for most of the, um, uh, you know, uh, most of the uh, Kahal to understand what was really going on. I mean, it, to conceptualize it. He understood, but they did not understand it because he, he, was, he was dealing with all aspects of the Svirot in the heavens. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I believe that maybe different levels. There were different levels of um, of the people. You know what I mean? Not everyone was not on that level, and not everyone was on that level. But yeah, but uh, you know, thank you for interacting uh, with Hashem. Yeah. He was interacting 
if he was interacting. Yeah, I don't know us. exactly your term. He was interacting with the sphere. I, I don't know about that, but he understood well, I mean, different different levels. But you have to go through all these these the various levels because that a human being could not comprehend. I mean, it's you know he he would speak to the uh, the kahal, but the, it, it doesn't seem possible that it would be on that they would be able to really conceptualize everything that he was. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, I just want to. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good point. So anyway, bottom line is here we have these two terms. So why did Hashem use these two terms, and um, and uh, why the redundancy? So he says, first of all, because there's two types of sacrifices. One is when you give a volunt voluntary sacrifice, and the other is hinting to the uh, uh, atonement sacrifice where a person sinned. And so when it talks about a person sinning, it uses the more harsher term, which is daber, which is um, it's like a decree from the king and the, the obligation to bring an atonement sacrifice. And it has all the details and the specifics mentioned. And uh, when it says Amar, which is more of a soft term, uh, which also is the, the word Amar uh, could also mean glorifying or honoring, respecting. Uh, Hashem, Hashem, you have uh, given a great praise to. So glorifying. So the word viamarta, which also means saying, but it's a more of a a, a kind a, a, a special term, which could also mean glorifying. Therefore, that word viamarta is referring to the voluntary sacrifices, and it's not uh, not obligatory. It's about elevation and honor. These are the terms he uses: elevation and honor, and. Um, Hashem elevated us through his willingness to accept these sacrifices. Now, um, so that's one way of understanding it. Now, uh, that it says both. Now, it says both. It's referring to the future verses that talk about these type of sacrifices. Now, uh, additionally, it's hinting to the sin offering that comes from a mistake. In other words, when a person does something, not on purpose, but by mistake, they bring a sin offering. Um, and there is the level of uh, speech, authoritative speech, which has to do with the um, obligation of bringing the sacrifice. And there is also the concept of saying the word amira, which means Hashem has accepted he, um, your sacrifice instead of your soul. Because really, if a person sins, there's a concept that they should really die because they went against creation of the world. You were here to serve Hashem and you didn't. So there's a, in theory, there's a concept of death. And you've caused death by sinning. Uh, cut yourself off, so to speak, from Hashem. But nevertheless... Hashem accepts the sacrifice in place instead of as a substitute for for the person who sinned. So uh, that is the uh, idea of Dabra al I'll speak to them the laws about the sacrifice, the obligation, and say to them, meaning that the other element of the sacrifice that's important is that it should be accepted by Hashem in place of the soul now and so those are the sacrifices that it mentions that these are all in place of the uh and this is a great honor for the jewish people and uh that's the idea of uh the amarta the amira and so on that this the word the, the term used is is amira speech in other words there's the the honor for us that hashem uh, or the special gift that Hashem gives us, so to speak, and uh, the obligation. Now uh, we have a few minutes. Yeah. So the next, uh, the next insight is that it uses the word Adam, a man that sins. Again, this is in verse two. Speak to the Jewish people and say to them. A person who sins, Adam Kiyakriv Mikem Karban Lashem, a person who sins from you. Uh, uh, when he brings close a sacrifice to Hashem from the animals. 
So the uh, Medrash Tanchuma, the Medrash says, why does it say Adam and not Ish? Ish is the, norm, is the regular term for man when a man sins. And it, here it says Adam. It's hinting to us about the primordial sin of Adam, Adam Arishain, the sin of Adam that um, that uh, brought sin to the world, that he... Um, If a person acts like him, like Adam, the, so it's the, the idea of Adam is mentioned because it's emphasizing if a person acts like Adam who started to sin, then he should also, he the person should bring a sacrifice. Now, what does it sound like? It sounds from this that the Adam was just like the person who sinned. They're both in the same league. And Adam Arishan was made of, was unintentional because uh um, it, it's saying that like Adam, he sinned, he should bring a sacrifice, implying like Adam Arishan also sinned by mistake, and he could have, should have brought a, a sacrifice. And that fits with what the verse says, that uh, Eve gave Adam to eat from the tree, and uh, he trusted her. Uh, and maybe he didn't intend to sin. And it was, there, there's such an understanding. And the, 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 the Archaim talks about it in, in, in the uh, in the in the portion of Horatius, that there's such an understanding that uh, she gave it to me to eat, and he trusted her that she would only serve him what's uh, permissible, and so he ate it by mistake, and so on. And um, and the the Medrash is basically saying that Hashem is doing a favor to you what he didn't do for Adam Arisha, because you can bring a sacrifice for your mistakes. Adam couldn't bring a sacrifice for his mistake. Adam Arisha sinned, and he he got punished that ultimately death would fall upon all of mankind, including himself. And so he got death for sinning, and we can bring a sacrifice, and it works for us. And what is the reason it didn't work for him? Because he was the first person who initiated sin, and he didn't have evil inside him to compel him to sin. However, we have a reason why our soul longs for sin. And therefore, um, the, and this is the sign, the proof that um, the, the, uh, the circumcision, the covenant of the circumcision is the proof that, uh, that we have a longing for sin. And that's what Hashem tells us to cut, to circumcise ourselves. But Adam Arishan didn't have to circumcise himself. Why? Because he was born without a uh, foreskin. And when he sinned, what happened was this he caused on himself and on all of his descendants that a, that a foreskin would grow. And that foreskin represents evil and impurity. So in other words, Adam did not merit that be able to bring a sacrifice because he caused sin to come onto man, and that's hinted to by the fact that he was not obligated initially to, uh, he was not told to circumcise himself because he never had a foreskin. And uh, when he sinned, ultimately that foreskin grew and it ultimately was passed on to all of mankind. And we have that, uh, we basically have that longing to sin, which is hinted to in this foreskin. And that's why we're told, we're commanded to. Uh, to remove that foreskin. And that's what the bris is, that we should be able to have more purity and a connection to purity. Okay, I want to wish all of you an easy fast. And um, also, I want to mention that on Sunday is Purim. So I want to wish you all a freilich and Purim. If anyone from our group wants to come to our program in Bell Harbor, you're welcome to, and it's free for you. You're, you don't have to pay. You're welcome to join us in Bell Harbor. Uh, at the uh, we're having a, a klezmer uh, event with a Megillah reading and so on, and um, are there classes? And there's no class on on, on Purim, but the Mir Tashem Shushan Purim will 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 start again. So in other words, on Monday. So we have a class tomorrow morning, and then a class on classes we uh, um, are back in Monday. back back on on Monday. So one day off. You have Sunday, which is Purim day. You have it off and have a Freilich and Purim. Zyg is on Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Thank you,